All right, welcome to the Westminster Center for Financial Wellness's Business Certificate Series. This is the Introduction to Investments course, and my name is Zach Moss. I made this course under the direction of Richard Haskell, and along with fellow students Tony Shi, Teddy Tenetche, Hannah Saitering, and Gustav Dahlman. This is Chapter 1 on the Economy, Markets, and Exchanges. Uh, in this chapter, we might be covering some, some things that seem somewhat remedial to you, uh, but irregardless, we have to go through them. We have to get a basic understanding of what these things are before we move forward into investing. So these are the segments of the chapter that we're going to be covering. Uh, it's economy versus the market. What's the difference? Three basic rules to get us started. Talk about interest rates, public and private investments, investment markets, and then brokers, dealers, and exchanges. And of course, we start out with the economy versus the market. So, what's the difference? More often than not, these two things get thrown around so interchangeably. Uh, and they're not. There is a significant distinction between the two. Uh, if you haven't seen this movie, you got to watch it. Uh, I'm just throwing this meme in there because. Uh, it makes perfect sense in uh, the application of the difference between people using the word the market when they're talking about the economy and vice versa. Okay, so the economy is the big picture. It's everything going on. Okay, if the economy is going well, then everybody's you know everybody in the entire economy on a general standpoint is doing pretty well. Okay, market is the more uh, consolidated piece of the economy. It's significant segments of the economy. What I mean by that is the markets make up the economy such that you have the automobile market, you have the housing market, you have the food market, and each of these individual markets are the building blocks for what is the economy. Okay, so a current example um, as of 2022, uh, and I'm make sure to not get Confused. I have a picture of gas prices here, but I'm not specifically talking about the gas prices. Um, I'm saying that the entire state of Cal California appears to be experiencing significant inflation right now. Okay, many in the state feel their economy is struggling. So it's not just the gas that is experiencing inflation; it's the entire economy. Make sure to make that distinction. Vice versa, uh, on the market side of things, I'm from Idaho. Okay, so I'm gonna use Idaho. Idaho potato examples way too often. I'm sorry for it. But what I'm saying here is that the Idaho potato market is booming, baby, because we're always booming. But just because the Idaho potato market is booming doesn't mean everything else is going strong. Okay, we suck at onions. All right, so getting into economic expansion simply means if there's economic expansion, the whole thing's growing. Okay, there is increased production increased employment on the other side of that there's lower unemployment unemployment and there's higher incomes economic expansion um you know that's the that's the sort of thing we see when everything on the news is talking about people making money and uh usually it's gonna this might be a value statement but it's gonna mean something about the middle class uh increasing its income okay Economic contraction is the opposite of that. That means that the economy is getting smaller, that there's less money being circulated around the economy, less people getting rich, the middle class is struggling. That means decreases in our production, increases in our unemployment, and lower incomes all around the board. Not going to get too uh, into my economic opinions on that stuff, but great meme from another great movie. Uh, What's going on with all the changes here is what uh, Dr. Evil is talking about after he comes out of cryo freeze. And uh, sometimes we're wondering the same thing with the economy. Why does it change so much? Why is it cyclical and it doesn't just grow? Well, there's your answer, folks. It, because, it is because the economy is made out of finite resources. Okay, There's finite resources which means there is a scarcity of resources we have unlimited wants and with those unlimited wants we have to address um a, a set of needs okay and we only have so many resources to do it with ah super scary sorry for all the means honestly um so what drives economic change like i said it's scarcity when demand for resources increases relative to supply it drives up prices um, and it causes uh, causes scarcity. 
Okay, don't get too stuck in the weeds on that. Just know that uh, the scarcity drives up. Scarcity makes the economy change. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, if there's a scarcity of potatoes in a market, their price is going to go up. Um, and that same in a, in a market, if there's that scarcity of potato, potatoes, um, what and might end up happening because the price of potatoes went up is people might start buying more sweet potatoes. Um, hopefully that hopefully that clicks. Okay, here is a big picture example of how some market scarcity um, can cause economic uh, contraction across the entire globe. So you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. So a famine in India, all right, it leads to a global shortage of rice because all of a sudden in that huge country of India, which is one of the main producers of rice in the world, they are not producing the same amount of rice that they typically would. Uh, that means there's less rice and less rice, um, a shortage of it drives prices up. Um, that's how supply and demand work, baby. So what causes um, after that is the increase in rice costs uh, tie up families' money across the world. Uh, they have uh, less of flexible uh, spending power because rice, if you're familiar with Asia at all, or even, you know, in plenty of places in America, it is a staple food. You have to have it on the plate um, for every meal. And uh, if you don't, you're in trouble. So uh, because people have to spend their money on more expensive rice, uh, it limits what they can and can't buy. Um, some of the things that they can and can't buy now might include things such as TVs, uh, landscaping, just uh Random examples, but people have to go to sustaining priorities, and their priority uh, is buying rice that's super expensive now. So what happens to these companies that produce um, what are called these discretionary goods uh, is they, they lose uh, money, uh, and they suffer losses, and they start to lay off people, unemployment, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, you've got the global economy beginning to contract. So kind of scary, but uh, another great meme. Hopefully you've seen SpongeBob. All right, so now, now that we have that basic understanding of how the economy changes and the fact that there are changes in the economy, we can start to figure out that there are benefits that we can, um, we can abstract uh, or take away from those changes. Okay, so here are three basic rules to get us started in understanding um, how we can take advantage of the benefits of change. Uh, those three basic rules are first, money changes value over time. Second, all investments can be measured in terms of money. That is our go-to metric for measuring value. Okay. And third, uh, risk and reward are two sides of the same coin. And I'll elaborate on these. First, the value of money changes. Dollars today, not the same as dollars next year. Okay. A dollar's value itself is based on what it can and can't buy. Without that ability to buy things, it is just a piece of paper. So when the price of things change, so does the value of the dollar. All right. So imagine, you know, you've seen this happen in your everyday life. Today, a potato costs a dollar. Tomorrow, it costs you 150. Next week, maybe it costs you 175 because there's an increased demand for potatoes and supply just isn't meeting it. Well, that means that the dollar's value is determined by what it can and can't buy. And if it can't buy um, as many potatoes as it used to, you know, say that to say that today it's worth two dollars. Well, it used to be able to buy two potatoes with two dollars. Now it's only buying one. So you get the idea. The value of a dollar changes. The second idea, second rule: every dollar you own is an investment. Doesn't matter where it is, because the value of money changes because the economy fluctuates everything is an investment rule one or the first reason for this is that there's lots of forms of currency and you chose to own a dollar um, so that's just you know the uh, blank and straight truth staring you right in the face uh, if you didn't know you could have chosen to own a peso and you chose to own a dollar okay and reason two is there are many ways to own a dollar 
um, and you've chosen one of those ways. Okay, and what those other ways to own a dollar is what we will go on to elaborate the most on. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about the different currencies you can own. We're mostly talking about the different types of investments you can make. The last part, in the world of investing, the greater your potential for grain, for gain, the greater your risk. All right, this is what I meant when I said that risk and reward are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. You want to invest in uh, a really uh, potentially profitable investment. Well, it means however uh, high your potential for profit might be, you have an equally low potential for risk. All right. So what I mean by that, uh, so say you had $400 10 years ago, you put half into a savings account and half goes into a Microsoft stock. Well, I can guarantee you that after 10 years, whatever you put in your savings account, that $200, it's going to be a lot closer to that original $200 value than the stock ever was. Okay. Um, now, if it's Microsoft, you're fortunate because you, you, you made a lot of money. But if it was some other company, perhaps one of those companies during the dot-com boom that went bust, well, then uh, your $200 is gonzo. All right. So here's an example to get you excited about investing. Because we already mentioned Microsoft, we'll do that. So let's say you put $200 into a Microsoft stock. Your annual rate of return on that investment, and I looked this up, it's going to be about 26.33%. That's ridiculous. That means your total increase after that 10 years, okay, is 936.94%. Your $200 turns into $2,073.88. That's crazy, but that's what investing does for you. Similarly, if you'd invested in a stock that went bankrupt, you would have $0 and you'd have lost the 200 